Coming up on DTNS, spoiler alert, we reveal everything that will happen in tech in the year 2024. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 29th, 2023. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Cube, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And of course, it is the last Daily Tech News show of 2023. Next time we meet, we'll be beginning our 11th year, Sarah. Um, I like it. It's a palindrome. Mm, you do like a palindrome. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. Uh, joining us to predict what is going to happen in 2024, our final episode of the year is what our predictions are going to be. Uh, and we have a great panel. Tasia Custodi, YouTuber and host of AI Name the Show and the Talk Techie to Me podcast. I predicted you'd be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me back, guys. We're going to nail it. We're going to nail it today. Yes, I agree. We're all going to be perfect in our predictions. Uh, it's just science. And that's because we have Dr. Nikki Ackerman's our DTNS science correspondent. Hello. Yes, I will predict the science. It's not something we always do, but I'll do it today just for you guys. Yeah. And uh, rounding out our sure thing of a panel, uh, producer, journalist, and sometimes co-host of Daily Tech Headlines, Jen Cutter. Hi, it's good to be back. I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident. Taking one moonshot here, but again, <laughs> gonna nail it. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Uh, well, Sarah Lane, you will lead us off, uh, lead off hitter, top of the lineup. Uh, what do you got coming in 2024? Well, I'm actually glad that I was the first to go today because I was kind of worried that other people would have the same prediction. But here goes. Prediction number one, VR will get new life as an office tool, and that mm -hmm. will be due to Apple's Vision Pro which is expected at the end of January, early Feb 2024. Now, of course, it's going to be a developer product and also very expensive, $3,500. So this is not like a consumer thing that's going to change the market overnight. But I think this is going to be the, you know, the, the, the big hardware and software boost that makes people who have written off VR is just not for them take another look. It's not for gaming, this is for work. And I think uh, Meta has been wanting that to be true of the MetaQuest Pro, <laughs> but I think you're right, Apple Apple always gives things a boost, right? Yeah, you know, the the uh, I don't really fault Meta for, for wanting to get into the game. I think Meta just made some funny missteps where it was sort of like avatars and cutesy. And, you know, they, maybe it's just because people want to ridicule meta for various things because it's meta, but it just, it never stuck with me. I, I love VR. Um, I'm a, I'm a quest, uh, uh, I was about to say aficionado enthusiast, but you know, I only play uh, a couple VR games and they're exercise games and I love them. And I think, you know, anybody who's like, yeah, I don't really know why you, you would even do that. It's like all you need is like an hour and somebody goes, oh, OK, I get it. But that means that you want to do what I'm doing. A lot of people are like, I don't have time for that or I have a gym membership or I just don't care. But when it comes down to something like working in um, in a space where you can, uh, I don't know, get things done probably in, uh, in a in smaller space than ever uh, for those of us who don't have huge offices. Um, this all sort of becomes your office. That's that's at least what I'm I'm thinking in my mind uh, is going to be the case by yeah, let's call it mid 2024. So they're Who's ready to use that cubicles yeah. into your VR headset, so you could just pretend you're in a cubicle. That's just what right. We're yeah, a cube <laughs> on your face. Yeah, smaller no, than can ever. Work from anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Which is you know, and there's. There's all sorts of, I don't know. I mean, you have people saying like, oh, VR makes you, um, you know, seasick. And and I, I, I've never experienced that. I know that's a real thing. And I don't exactly know how trying to focus and work on something like DTNS on a daily basis would, you know, is that something I can do uh, with a Vision Pro headset? I don't know yet. I think a lot of people are also not knowing for sure, but are gonna try. Mm -hmm. And, you know, developers are going to try to make killer apps for for this new for this new uh, this new normal of ours. I think you're right. But here's I, where I, I see stuff like Vision Pro is I think of it in terms of having a second screen as large as I want without having 
to travel with a second screen. So like a lot of the times, like if I'm back and forth between here and Canada and I'm still working and I'm like bringing all my gear, obviously I never bring my second monitor. So I'll be editing on my MacBook Pro. And I, as soon as I saw Vision Pro, I was like, oh, to me, the target is remote work. <laughs> like I was just yeah. like, I get it when I'm traveling. How great would it be to just have everything, a touch screen as big as I want and I can do my editing theoretically, if this works like it's supposed to, on a huge second screen. And I, I only have to bring one headset, which arguably will get smaller in the years to come. But that's not for next year. It'll mm-hmm. get smaller eventually. I also agree in terms, I feel like the companies are pricing it so that it would do well in, in a way where like companies would purchase them for their employees because they don't really think about price too much for these kinds of things. I wonder if this happens, if your prediction comes true, if they would get pigeonholed into this is the new office device and then like doesn't get branched out into other things. So that's my pre- double prediction. to you. Yeah, yeah. A little, little, <laughs> little add on there. I like that. <laughs> I, I'm 50-50 because my main problem with VR is it doesn't fit my head. Oh, my God. I yeah. swear mm-hmm. I'm proportioned fine, but I wear a junior helmet and ice hockey, which is in an extra small cage. So finding a headset that fits my head and doesn't do this, I haven't found it yet. But I think Apple's pretty accessible and surely they will have something to handle that. You know, that that is that's a real concern though, Jen. Um, you know, I I I jump around doing exercise games in VR and I don't know, I I just make everything fit, you know, by pulling everything as tight as possible. But I also look insane when I take it <laughs> off for an hour, if not more. I mean, to the point where if I'm in public, I have to say to people, I'm so sorry, I was just doing <laughs> VR stuff. And they go, oh, okay, weird. Um, you know, but that's, that's, I mean, that, that's a real concern. Kind of like, you know, how certain earbuds just aren't going to work. If yeah. it's something doesn't feel comfortable and or even fit you, that, that's a real concern. Yeah, and that's why you hear so much about Apple bringing in their retail arm on this and having fittings requiring you to go to a store and stuff mm-hmm. like that because they they're definitely thinking about it. whether they'll solve it or not a whole different thing. But mm-hmm. uh, it does sound like they're they're thinking about it. Uh, Sarah, what is your second prediction for 2024? All right, so this one is a little bit of a maybe if I speak it into existence, it will happen. <laughs> and this is that. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm talking about social networking. Uh, where's the place that I used to hang out? That was Twitter. Not, not the only place, but that was my place. Twitter now X, not the same place. Now I don't want to make it seem like, oh, it's dead because it isn't. But of all of the people that I have followed over the years, um, you're all a part of that. Um, when I, when I have, I don't know, logged into, you know, x.com recently, uh, more and more, I realized that everyone is gone. Or they're not mm-hmm. just talking. Or the people you follow anymore. anymore are gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, mm-hmm. the platform is, right, is, right. is dead in any case. It's just that my carefully curated community of, you know, a thousand people that I was following. I mean, following quite a few people, some of those, you know, journalists that I don't even know, some of those friends, et cetera, et cetera, family members. It's just, it is feeling like a dead zone for me. Now, I have uh, reasons that I would like threads to become the new place because I just want the new place to happen somewhere. And thread mm-hmm. seems to have the most momentum. But of course, you've got Mastodon, you've got Blue Sky, you've got uh, a variety of other options. I was thinking, all right, uh, if, if I'm looking at a year from today, end of 2024, I'm going to predict that X will no longer be. It will be sold off for parts. I thought maybe the Blue Sky team. Um, now, I know Jack Dorsey, uh, Twitter uh, co-founder and former CEO um, a couple times, uh, moved over to Blue Sky, is no longer active at Blue Sky. But I have to assume that, and Blue Sky is not doing Activity Pub, which Threads is doing and Mastodon is doing. So I don't know, kind of an outlier. But I would think that there are probably people working on the Blue Sky uh, platform protocol that have deep Twitter roots 
that would care. Yeah, the Blue Sky more. team was created within Twitter when Dorsey yeah. was in charge. So they, there's a lot of former Twitter people there. That, that's you, totally you reasonable. would you would think that would be that would be the platform where people would go like, yeah, we could we could make something of this. Now I realize a lot of stuff has to happen for this to be the case. So this is a little bit of a shot in the dark, shot in the dark mm -hmm. here. But if advertising revenue continues to fall, um, which it has across lots of aspects of tech, um, but certainly, you know, X is, is not exempt from that. I could see someone like Elon Musk saying, I don't really want to do this anymore. You know, I've got other projects, which he does. And, um, and, and other folks go into greener pastures. Who can separate their emotions from from their <laughs> analysis of this? Uh, and because oh. I predicted this last year, I said, mm -hmm. "Oh, no. by the by the end of 2023, uh, Salesforce or somebody will come in and 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 buy up Twitter." Uh, so I think it's smart, Sarah, to go like, "Oh, you were wrong last year, but maybe you'll." Maybe it'll happen this year. <laughs> well, and I, I mean, this was definitely not some own on you, Tom. No, I, no, I, no, I actually I, I thought a year ago that up. you might be right. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just been a pretty chaotic year for X. Oh, yeah. You know, so. And if I, well, I guess what I was saying is, if I thought that could happen last year when it was doing all right, like it seems even more likely now, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I guess my question to the panel is, you know, if you if you don't think this is the case, then you don't think this is the case. But if it is. You know what? What would what what does X become? Is it really sold for parts? Mm -hmm. um, you know, which kind of I don't know. It's kind of sad. I don't necessarily want that to happen. But is that is that the best uh, path forward for you know all the people who have built it into something that didn't work perfectly, but has certainly um, been part of our lives for for decades? I should have worn oh. my Twitter shirt. <laughs> Aww. Aww. It's so sad. It's not going anywhere and you're going to pry it from my cold dead hands. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Bring back the fail whale. Come on. I know. Iconic. I I don't know, man. I think it just it's missing. I'm not detaching my emotions from this, but I think it's just missing that little spark. If Blue Sky can replicate that and the people all actually go there. That could be the new Twitter and or, or X and that one just dies. But I don't know if that little magic can happen. I don't know anyone knows how to make it happen. That's the key, though, is like exactly what you just said is then if people go there, like mm -hmm. Sarah, you mentioned threads and it's like threads is already dead to me. Threads was like quick get <laughs> yeah. on in the first day when everybody went on. And then I literally never signed on again in my life. And mm, so it's like yeah. I don't need another spot to go. Yeah. So it's exactly like what you're saying, Dr. Nikki, is like, but I already have a spot to go. <laughs> so mm. like, unless we're just like redoing the spot and everybody joins and it's then it's the same thing we already had and it's a nostalgia thing. Oh no, you're saying X marks the spot. Oh, Listen, oh. I'm still calling it Twitter because oh. it is twitter.com and you will yeah, not get me to change that there, until yeah. that changes, until that, it becomes x.com. So I fluctuate, I go Twitter, X, Twitter, it's Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, we I think it's we, around. There's, uh, we talk about this regularly on the show. And uh, it's, I guess the question is sort of like, does X die and get reborn as something else that's super fun? Or do we just Wish. all do other things and say, eh, yeah. social networking is not, you know, the thing that it used to be anymore. And we don't need that. I don't really know what the answer is yet. Well, they're I, all the same at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, the one thing Twitter still has for me that the other places don't is hockey Twitter. I mean, yes. Because like, the, the sports community hasn't moved yet. I've got all my movie people on Blue Sky. I've got all my InfoSec people on uh, Mastodon. Threads, I'm kind of personally offended by at this moment because I still don't have hashtags. <laughs> <laughs> I update every day. And for some reason, I thought it's not even a Canadian thing. My Canadian friends have them. I don't. So that's my beef with threads right now. But I need hockey Twitter to go somewhere. And that that's going to be a place I check more yeah. often. K-pop Twitter hasn't all. moved either. All right. So those are my predictions. Uh, Tasia, we're going to move on to you next. Uh, hit us. What's number one? Okay, guys, and mine are so un unrelated to each other. But my first one is that AI is going to revolutionize the healthcare industry in, I'm going to get very specific for you guys, in vaccine development, getting ahead of the next pandemic, 
and maybe perhaps I'm going to shoot shoot for the stars here, fighting antibiotic resistance, mm. question mark on that one. Oh. But sure, I'll put it in 2024. And not to sound like a doomer, you guys, like when I'm talking about getting ahead of the next pandemic, but I think we already saw such huge developments, like when we were talking about like mRNA technology and all this kind of stuff. And like most people just equate that with like the COVID vaccine, but it's been in development years before COVID was even, oh God, in our vernacular, if you will. So it's really helped already in terms of like how we were able to do such quick vaccine deployment, if you think about it. Like I'm pretty sure Moderna was able to like get a vaccine ready in 42 days for trials. Mm. That's That's nuts. So I'm expecting more of that, but even quicker and faster, just like we're seeing all kinds of other AI developments happening. And, you know, when you think of things like how I think it's like G7 and G20, they're, they started like this whole 100 days mission thing, which is basically like they want to establish like a global vaccine library, which cool. I'm really hoping this happens like next year so we can get ahead of the next pandemic. Not too freak everybody out and think i mean i am a germaphobe but still um <laughs> I mean, it might have, happen though yeah if we can use this technology to be developing things sooner and then say and then use it to like i'm not the scientist here but use it to like segment and make predictions and say we think this is where like the next like whatever x thing is coming from so like how do we get ahead of it what's our preparedness plan so i think there's a lot of layers to it but that's my general first prediction And by the way, before you guys tell me what you think, I just want to (laughs) say I am in good company here because Mr. Bill Gates himself also Mm. thinks there's going to be a lot of developments. However, his was like in the next decade. So I'm really shooting for the stars here, you guys. (laughs) No, it's next year. It's not the next decade. It's next year, sir. (laughs) We have to manifest it. I mean, the way AI has has, uh, transformed life uh, very rapidly, I, I, I'd be inclined to go with you. Nikki, you know, being the scientist of the group, yeah. you know, what, what, what do you think about that? So I would have to ask a more precise question, like what specifically about the vaccine would AI be influencing? Because there's lots of different areas where it could impact. Which one do you think is going to cause this, this acceleration? I know you said like predicting the future pandemic, which I could see but i need more details (laughs) yeah i don't i and i really don't even know if it's like a combination of all of it if it's maybe you know how the technology works in terms of how it can detect specific things on a molecule of a whatever i don't know i'm again not a scientist but like is that going to help so like if we're talking about antibiotic resistance yeah is it going to be something where that's going to be able to detect and say okay we know why this is happening and like here's the little minute piece like the molecule piece that's causing this and here's what we can do to just boop, very quickly tweak an antibiotic so that you're no longer resistant to it or something i mean i don't know no i think that's right especially in terms of viruses if we stick with viruses they mutate so frequently and all the a million potential variations of them happening is something that the human brain would have a lot of hard time predicting and even a regular computer would have a hard time predicting. So I think AI on that front, um, I don't know if it's actively been used to help us predict, you know, new COVID variants. It probably has. I just haven't read the papers, but I would assume that that's a tool that is just actively being used and we don't even hear about it because it sounds boring Mm -hmm. to the everyday, you know, schmo, but it's actually Mm -hmm. a nice defense mechanism almost. I yeah, think like you're I know, hundred percent right. Oh, okay, good, thanks. <laughs> yeah, well, because like, <laughs> well, we I all can't about, be wrong. Yes, well, I heard about trials where they've been using it to detect cancer early with a mm. decent success rate, and I want to see more of that. It's the one place where I think AI is really going to do the most good. So, yes, I'm That's also going to manifest it's also my prediction, <laughs> and I'm, I'm hoping you're right. Yay. Yeah, um, I, when I was when I was hearing you talking about this, Tasia, I was just thinking that uh, the the fact that you know we think of COVID as the pandemic, but there were pandemics before COVID. Oh yeah, they weren't as intense as COVID as far as lockdowns and effects. Uh, but there are always pandemics. There's other SARS. The 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 reason it's not SARS one <laughs> is because there've been other SARS. So so be yeah. More being ready for those pandemics and making sure to keep them from maybe even becoming pandemics uh, is something that that I think these kinds of models can be really helpful in predicting and then matching up uh, potential vaccines. These models are not good at creating stuff, but they're really good at sorting through endless mm-hmm. possibilities. And that's what you need here. Agree. 
All right, Tasia, what is prediction number two? Completely switching gears for everybody. Um, and I think mine's maybe more of like a hope and a prayer than a prediction necessarily, but YouTube will finally kill shorts because they should have never been there in the first place and just stick to being really great at one thing. You don't have to be all things to all people. This is like a personal <laughs> hang up for me and I'm really just manifesting this. Like, please, can we have an end of shorts? I stopped trading them. I actually deleted all of them from my channel. I've never like really watched anybody's shorts. So I'm very Maybe. curious to know, is this just me being in like a negative anger bubble over the platform trying well, so to be all things? Or do you guys love shorts? Am I completely wrong? But As a I think content it ruined the creator, platform. what what do you not like about shorts? Because to hear YouTube talk about it, shorts is on the up and up. You know, lot lots of views. Um, you know, gonna run ads on shorts, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's multiple things. I'm not a big vertical video person anyway. Like I understood it when it kind of came to Instagram because so much of our content consumption on there is just like small device. And maybe I do look at it a bit different because I create on YouTube. So I'm very used to horizontal long form content. And that is how I like to watch things. Even now when I'm consuming YouTube, most of the time, like it's again, I'm turning my device horizontal. I'm watching it on my TV. I'm mm -hmm. watching it on my MacBook. So it's, that's how I'm consuming. I'm not using YouTube for the quick scroll. Like when I'm in bed and I wanna just like zone out and instead of reading my book, and I'm just like on Instagram reels, I'm not using YouTube in that way. Like I go to YouTube for people that I subscribe to and typically longer form helpful content. So I think for me, I've been confused from the get with why they thought they had to make this big push. That's kind of the first thing. And then the second thing, so like it ruined the feel for me. But then the second thing is as a creator, there's no money to be made in that anyway, because it's short content. And the third thing is their music library still sucks for shorts. And <laughs> they've claimed in this whole year that, oh, we're getting like actual popular music and trending music and it's still terrible. And you really don't have many options and you're capped at a certain length if you are using one of the popular songs, whereas like on Instagram, whatever you can do longer. So I have a lot of beef with shorts and I would like to see it die. And I'll add another thing. They keep sending me emails about it to push it. They keep sending all this stuff. And it's like, if you have to push it this hard, it's not working, honey. I'm so sorry to tell you. Stop like, trying to make oh. Fetch happen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty much. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm with you, Tasia. I, I don't even watch Instagram uh, stories all that much but because I don't know. There's an ephemeral thing where I'm like, too much pressure. I'm busy. You know, just like if you like a photo or a video, just post it and I'll come back to it at some point. Um, YouTube, even more so. However, there are other people I've talked to who are like, yeah, but YouTube is kind of like where all my people are. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's the creators that I follow. I like the short form stuff. I mean, this is the TikTok revolution, right? All the platforms have to at least try it. Um, but, I, but I'm with you. It, it has never felt like the 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 place where short form content will thrive the most again i'm not really a youtube I, i'm certainly not a creator and i don't hang out on youtube enough to know i i don't know if anybody else on this panel feels differently i first of all i prefer pants but i've been waiting to make that joke <laughs> for five minutes um i have never seen a Took short nor been sent a short nor even kind of i know they exist because of dtns but i've never they've never crossed my radar at all and that must be telling and i spend quite a bit of time on tiktok to the point that i have parental controls on my phone <laughs> but yeah shorts has never even gone anywhere near my screen so maybe maybe that's something that's all but, so i agree i'll say that yes <laughs> well, I'm going hope. to be the uh, contrarian then. Oh. I hated shorts to start. I absolutely hated them. I hated how they were pushed. I hated how it took over my dashboard. But I am watching them a lot more recently and more of them than I did do generally on TikTok because TikTok videos for vertical video, I find are too long. I'm not going to watch a 10 minute mm. vertical video. I'd rather you just made a YouTube. But for the actual shorts on YouTube, they are short enough that it's like, yeah, I'll scroll for a little bit. Or in my case, I tend to go for the specific content creators I like because I mm. know they're going to hit exactly what I want. But 
I don't know how long YouTube will stick with it, but I don't think it'll die next year. I really want to support Tasia, so <laughs> I, I feel bad saying that I I think shorts are working really well for DTNS. Oh, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> they don't make money. Although I, you know, my friend Lamar Wilson will, would disagree about short video not making money because he he has his entire career built on that, uh, and it's TikToks, shorts, Instagram stories, etc. But but for us, it's it's just been really good promotion. We get a lot more engagement there, and I and I I think I, that I too agreed with you out of the gate, and I, it sounds like Jen did too. We're like, this is not YouTube's thing. Why are they pushing this? But it really does seem like it's working, and it seems like you know maybe I was wrong about that. So I don't know. Maybe we're just bullies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's so content dependent. And it's interesting, Jen, like how you're consuming shorts, because I think that's like a key difference between mm -hmm. the short form content platforms, if you will, because like on a TikTok or an Instagram, for me and for millions of users, we're just like basing on an algorithm. It's not like I'm going to a specific person that I follow and then I'm scrolling to see like their reels tab yeah. like i'm just going to reels and i'm just scrolling through random. i'm fed random stuff whereas it seems like you're consuming shorts in a much more curated way which would make sense we've yeah. been trying it for like one of my clients to like push her longer form content it's not hurting her channel it's not helping it at all mm -hmm. it's like very it's like cricket so i really think it's like content style content type dependent if you will if yeah, that makes yeah. sense no that makes that does make sense because there's the it really comes from tiktok and there are a lot of things like tiktok on youtube but there's a lot of stuff on youtube that's not uh and it would make sense that 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 kind of stuff wouldn't work as well all right let's turn to dr nikki uh who teased one of her predictions earlier what's your first prediction for 2024 nikki yeah, so surprisingly, I also went with AI. I mean, I, th I thought we would all just say, like, it's all going to be AI everywhere. So um, I think there's going to be it's, it's a very vague prediction, but there's going to be way more AI in science. It's almost the only science news that I, is like the first line today. But I went in like two different categories. I think in terms of research, there's going to increase discovery in areas that require a lot of computing. Uh, quantum physics, like coming mm. up with theories for quantum physics, because it's just too much for at least my brain. So I would need an AI, <laughs> but also things like protein structure. And this is something that's already happening with Google's AlphaFold. And I've had people at work come up to me and say that they have used AlphaFold to predict protein structure. So more of that and more precision in that, because it's still not necessarily trustable. Um, and then the other half of this two-parted prediction is um, getting AI used way more in medical diagnosis. And I think this has a pro and a con. Um, it's actually probably already being implemented in cases. If you remember uh, during COVID, there was a big AI thing that came out about um, looking at lung x-rays and seeing COVID patients, identifying them using an AI based on those images. Um, another thing that's going on right now is like looking at cells and if they have a specific shape, you could detect Alzheimer's disease. So predictions like that, where you just have a ton of data and you just need it to match patterns like Tom was saying earlier um, and lots of numbers, that's where AI is good. And I think we'll be seeing that in terms of like regular patient diagnosis and not just research. Um, but then the problem with this is if it starts to get integrated with like healthcare and then it amplifies our biases and things like that, that's where I'm a little bit concerned. So that's my number one prediction. Tasia, it kind of goes along with what you were saying earlier. Yeah. What do you think of this? <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I do completely agree because especially since we are already seeing so many developments in the healthcare field with AI, but I do kind of mirror what Dr. Nikki's saying in terms of the concerns. Like I'm here for the, you know, anything that can get people better care quicker, I'm absolutely here for as long as it's like accurate care. Yeah. The Another concern I have is in that healthcare space like there's a lot of stuff already happening with helping like i want to say it's maybe like the mayo clinic has been doing this where they're using like ai algorithms and systems to basically couple the data from like a patient so like a doctor doesn't have to go to a million different places internally i don't mean like their personal external data, to gather like the history of a patient so if somebody presents at the hospital with something and you need to know immediately like if you're treating them like you know they're not conscious like what 
what are they on? Like, what's their medical history? They're able to like pull from this data set already, which I think stuff like that is really, really great. I just get concerned in terms of like privacy and like Dr. Nikki's saying, um, accuracy and also the biases in that as well. And like a lot of the biases come from the people that are building these and AI the medical systems. structure as it exists already. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, exactly. There was so a really like interesting back. discussion on this on The Economist about bias, uh, where one of their guests was saying, "Are we are noisy as humans. We're kind of unpredictable. Yes. We're inconsistent. And that covers our biases. And the reason we're seeing bias in AI more is because it's not noisy. And so all the human biases that it was trained on, because it's just trained on what we do, show mm-hmm. up clearer because yeah. of that. Yeah, if you say something like, you know, um, accidentally more redheads get uh, high blood pressure, this is completely fictional. And it could just be that in that one hospital, there's just a lot of redheads that live nearby, but then like AI would amplify yeah. that because it's feeding off of that data set. And then mm-hmm. it'll say like, oh, your blood pressure is bad, but that, that's the kind of thing I'm a little bit worried about to, yeah. to clarify. Jen, what do you think? Dr. Nikki, you made me so happy saying that they're working on it for Alzheimer's because that affects my family greatly. And yeah, like any kind of early detection on that would be truly amazing. So I'm going to go with, yay, 100%, let's go. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's get to you. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. (laughs) I was going to say, I'm I'm actually, I do some Alzheimer's, very farly related Alzheimer's work and early detection is the thing that NIH is dumping money into as much as they can. So hopefully that money dump helps. And I know there's going to be AI projects in in the grant requests coming up. So that's the nitty gritty of that. All right, let's get to your second prediction. Dr. Nikki, what do you think is going to happen in 2024? So this is my more out in space one, but it's related to a DTNS topic that I covered this year. And I think we're going to have more nanobots, mostly because people love nanobots. So I was like, (laughs) I got to talk about them. But when we brought them up earlier in the year, um, I think they were be using, actually being used for antibiotic resistance, uh, which we talked about already in the show. Um, and I think that they were still kind of figuring out how to get them into the body without getting rejected. And then basically, once you get nanobots into the body, once you pass that hurdle, you can do so many things with them. So you could, um, for example, do antibiotic resistant bacterial infections and treat those. Um, drug delivery, you could like, get one in there that's a mechanical nanobot that could like cut out a blood clot. Uh, you could help with IVF. You could do all these things, but the the problem to solve is fixing, getting them into the body and not getting rejected. So I'm predicting that we fix this next year and then it's going to be an exploding field. Um, also, not necessarily in the human body, but NASA has a plan for an autonomous nanotechnology swarm called ANTS that are going to go into space. And I thought that was cool. So I'm going to add that to my nanobot prediction as well. (laughs) So, okay. So uh, talking about nanobots, let's say I have a life-threatening brain clot, right? Mm -hmm. What are my options now and how would the nanobot revolution uh, help me going forward? Very good question. I think, and I'm not a surgeon or a human doctor, so I think the option now would be surgery or laparoscopic, like you go in through an artery. I don't, you probably shouldn't do that up into the brain. I don't really know, but I'm assuming you shouldn't do that. And so nanobots, you just inject them into your bloodstream and they'll have, they'll be programmed for a specific target. So like, I don't know, probably there's a protein in blood clots that it can target for, and it'll like zoom up into there and then like mechanically destroy that blood clot without having to have any kind of surgery. That's amazing. Yeah. That, I mean, that would be pretty potentially. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. If that's maybe I want this, I want this yeah. for us. Yeah. We all do. I don't well, know if there's well downsides done. to nanobots though. Like they take over your body. I don't know. Oh no. Yeah. They're hacked. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or, like, or, or they just your like cholesterol is crazy. <laughs> oh, the nanobots are mad. Nanobots. <laughs> yeah, they just start synthesizing <laughs> cholesterol to get back at you. So they're angry. Yeah, I could see the downside being some some kind of unintended side effect of them being in your system, possibly. Sure. But they're early early indications are there's nothing alarming about that, right? Just rejection. Mm-hmm. Um, that the body will reject them, which is surprising because they're very small. They're nano scale, yeah, yeah. Uh, but still the body like can find them and, and then pr- pretends like it's an infection. So it's just getting past yeah. that stage. Why is the human body so amazing? Uh, trial and error. <laughs> and because we died a lot before we got this far. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I would say amazingly annoying half the time, but yeah. also yeah, still amazing. I mean, here we all are. How about that? I know I hear about getting in the nanobots and my brain's going like, okay, but after they do their thing, then how do they get out? Hopefully you could just like pee them out or something. Yeah, you pee them out like everything else. (laughs) No, you just ask them nicely to leave and they say, okay. A really big magnet. That's going to be, don't say pee them out and a big magnet. (laughs) Uh, I, yeah, there's gonna be there's gonna be nanobot pollution from everybody yeah. expelling the microplastics. That's gonna be the problem. Oh, yeah. yeah, add mm-hmm. more pollution. Uh, well, folks, uh, we know you've got predictions. If you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show, uh, get in touch with us. Let us know on the social networks. You know, we're we're sitting here on the holiday break, uh, waiting to hear from you. DTNS show on X. Uh, DTNS show at Mastodon, M-S-T-D-N dot social, uh, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks on Instagram and Threads. All right, Jen Cutter, it's time for your predictions. What's up first? The first one is my depressing one. Video (laughs) game layoffs. It's been bad this year, and I think it's also going to be dire next year. I had to write these numbers down because I didn't want to get them wrong. So in the last few months, we had Epic with around 830 people. Twitch, which I'm counting as gaming, not just IRL stuff, uh, they gave up a big percentage. Uh, Amazon Games, 180. Newverse, a bite dance, the TikTok company, dropped about 1,000 people recently. And then Unity had their 265 people recently. But also, people are forgetting that back in May, they dropped another 600 people. And that's not even counting the smaller studios like Paradox. I'm going to count Ubi as like a medium-sized studio these days. EA had theirs. Uh, There's a site called videogamelayoffs.com, which has been keeping track of it if you want to be really depressed about the state of gaming. So I think next year is going to also be bad. I think the big companies are going to continue to scale down. Companies chasing trends are going to launch, then die, which has happened a couple of times this year. And even a lot of the companies who let go of senior people who went on to build their own story, their own uh, dev shops, uh, I think they're going to run into trouble with the VC and private equity money that they brought in because they're not going to want to wait two, three years for a game that is a maybe. So I think there's going to be a lot of bloodletting there. And that is my very sad prediction. Mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> do, you, do you feel like, uh, you know, and Jen, I know you follow this pretty closely. I mean, do you feel like a lot of these companies were just bloated with too many employees? Because sometimes that does happen. You know, you have a little bit of a market correction and all of a sudden people go, wait a second, you know, who who are all these middle managers who maybe weren't contributing yeah. directly to something that, you know... Too much were, hiring in the good times, right? Right, yes. right. I, you know, and, and not that, you know, I I wouldn't pretend to understand what really happens inside a gaming studio, but it does seem like Gaming is on the up and up. It's not that people don't care about games. They care about games more than ever. And yet people are still losing their jobs. There was definitely a bit of a hiring boom during COVID when everybody tripled down and had access to more talent because a lot of studios went fully remote. But uh, I think as a result of that, yes, some people had to let go. And I think a lot of the trend chasing has hurt people. And I think the unionization efforts have also caused some companies to be like, oh, I see who's doing this. We're going to find a reason to let them go. Mm -hmm. It's been making me happy how many studios are trying to unionize and QA especially, who never get any credit. And we would not have functional video games without QA. They've had a lot of losses this year. My question is, what about... I thought this year we had like so many massive games. We had the new Zelda game. We had Baldur's Gate. We had another one, Starlink, I think. No, Starfield. Starfield. Yeah. Sorry. Um, is that <laughs> not helping bring new people on those massive successes, or are those different companies? Like, what what's going on with that? Those are great examples of what happens when a company stands behind their devs. 
there's still crunch mm -hmm. problems. But those games took years and years of extremely talented people. Nintendo especially, they're known for keeping dev teams together. There are people who worked on uh, Tears of the Kingdom who worked on the original Zelda. Like, that's just course, incredible. Yeah. But that kind of seniority is getting more and more rare across the industry. And I think games are going to suffer for that a bit. It's why I'm rooting for the newer, smaller shops to see if they can bring that kind of magic and continuity of their experience. Because an average uh, game developer career, if you last 10 years, you're a grandpa. That is a miracle. <laughs> Worse than sports. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Jen, what is your next prediction? Well, as we're all going for moonshots, my moonshot is AI related in a bit of a different tact. Uh, I am trying to, again, will into existence that next year search engines will have a better way to filter AI sludge so that they do not become fully useless when looking for things. I'm sure I am not alone in being the tech support for an extended group of people. And it has been harder to teach them how to sort out the AI stuff from actual product reviews. My dad's been trying to buy a camera. He sends me all these links that are not real. So I've had to teach him, okay, search the name of the camera plus Reddit. Because <laughs> so far Reddit seems to be, or at least is so far holding out from being all astroturfed. And uh, yeah, I'm just finding it such a mess online and I want it cleaned up, please. Yeah, and they can use large language models and, and other kinds of models to help clean it up, right? Fight fire with fire. I want this to happen so bad. So I will agree with you that this will happen because it's such a pain. How is it How is it so backwards that we have to Google everything with Reddit at the end to find an actual answer? Like, isn't Google supposed to be powerful and they're just looping themselves into AI nonsense? Yeah, please make this happen. Yeah, image searches especially oh. seem heavily affected. Like there yeah. was back in the day when, you know, uh, Etsy and Pinterest were taking over Google Images and there was yes. ways that you could work around sorting that. But right now, I don't know a good way to sort around the AI images, especially yeah. for, you know, historical events, because you can't do minus creating AI. Alternates. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Nobody uses uh, Google for search anymore. It's all you just use TikTok. Uh, I do that, too, though. <laughs> it's so hard finding like product, like you said, with your dad, products or product reviews. Like I yeah. can't trust anything. It's just ads or, or AI images. Yeah, I'm also still birds. I'm still unclear yeah. on how TikTok is a great search engine. That's because we're I, old, Sarah. Same. Well, I know, I, I know, I know. I I, but... I feel old, and I I have you know people who are older than me, you know, <laughs> on Earth, um, being like, oh yeah, TikTok is like where I find all my news, and I'm like, how? In the same way that Reddit is, it's because you can mostly tell that it's like a person and this person's opinion and sometimes you can tell that they're paid but at least you get more than just like yes this camera is best camera ever made please buy camera at least sure. right yeah. Yeah. yeah the internet can't stop talking about this camera back in stock <laughs> doctors don't want you to know what people say about this camera yeah. Yeah. everyone's talking about the how one amazing. thing you do every saturday for this camera mm -hmm. Oh, oh gosh, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I like this, Jen. I think it's a good one. Uh, and and I think e if you look at Bard uh, and what they've been doing in in search and Google search engine, uh, the G the Google search experience uh, with bringing in some of that 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 magic to it, you can see how it helps. Like I, I've already noticed some of those those generated summaries are much more useful than some of the search results below, uh, and there'll be a battle yeah. over that for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, finish it up with my predictions. Uh, I'm going to go a little different direction here uh, and make a prediction around large language models. Uh, so, so <laughs> bucking the trend of of everyone AI. You say, AI. Tom? I Weird. just won't say AI when I say it. Um, I think we're going to get large language model specialization. I think that will be a big trend in 2024. So this idea of having a monolithic model, like, oh, it's ChatGPT, oh, it's Gemini, oh, it's Anthropic, uh, will be seen as unwieldy and unnecessary and oversimplifying. Uh, getting LLMs that are trained for a specific purpose, 
like looking for good images, for instance, that aren't AI generated, uh, more LLMs that can be run on your device so that you don't have to send it to a cloud and use a data center. Uh, some of that will become more popular, but I, I think we'll shift from thinking like, oh, ChatGPT should do everything to, to specialized uh, models that you you use for purposes that you need them for. A hundred percent. That's a very yeah. smart prediction. Could we not be more right. <laughs> it's well, you're singing my tune, here. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But like, look at like, I mean, there's already a bunch of say like on device specific ones out, like even like Gemini Nano, I think is the one yeah. made specifically for mobile devices. But uh, yeah, we are just still like, if you guys think about it, we're only 13 months from ChatGPT yeah. becoming available to the public. So like wow. how much we've boom, like exploded in just that amount of time and all of the competition, which is really great to see. Um, it's how do we do it all safely? Yes. And, with, and the, with the LLMs, Tom, I'm not going to say yeah, I'm, the AI. I'm fucking the system and not doing an AI prediction here. I'm doing an LLM prediction. Um, yeah, I, I, I think a lot of the problems that we talk about with ChatGPT and even Bard and Bing's version of ChatGPT are because we're trying to have it be everything to everybody. Mm. Uh, and that's that's a lot harder to police. It's a lot harder to have quality. But if you have a specific model that's like, oh, this is meant for this, then it's it becomes way easier to keep it from doing unexpected yeah. things and monitor hallucinations and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I think we spend an inordinate amount of time being like, well, look how it got it wrong. Yeah, look at this, <laughs> you know, which is it's true. I mean, it's, it's not perfect, universe. and and no and no model is. Um, but a little bit a, a little bit less of oh well, this is not good for all things, and a little mm -hmm. bit more of this is where this is really good for that kind of query. Yeah, yeah. And we as humans are gonna have to get used to that too. In that zone, do you think a LLM that's good at predicting? if things came from LLM, like an LLM detector, a better one would happen because a silly example of just like us grading students at the university, mm -hmm. none of our actual detectors work. And so we cannot really prove mm. that they've used an, a an LLM for making mm. text. Mm -hmm. That would, that we need that. Yeah. I think you have a better shot at that, uh, especially if it's, this is an LLM trained on papers we know were handed in in an academic setting yeah. and generated by another model than like, well, let's just run it through GPT-4. And it's like <laughs> using the entire training set of the world, right? Like, I think I think we can get more specialized and, and those, those tools might end up being better. At least that's the prediction. Well, to so. borrow from Sarah and your point, uh, I don't know if anyone's followed the stories of the lawyers who used ChatGPT yes. to yeah. make up cases. And those cases <laughs> ended up before a judge and obviously opposing counsel was like, wait a minute, these do not <laughs> exist. But as Tom was saying, if they made a, space, uh, a very specific law one, mm -hmm. would they be able to put that problem behind them? Yeah, potentially, right? The, the, there's a, certainly a better chance of it, I think. I, I mean, I think what you're referring to, Jen, is just like that lawyer should have checked his work. Yeah, <laughs> his been problem a was of lawyers he, now. like they just go, "Oh, well, this is what ChatGPT told me, so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's accurate." <laughs> Instead of just Re doing a quick search to see yes. is this a real thing. Good reducing point. hallucinations is what. Uh, yeah, yeah, reducing yeah. the hallucinations for sure. I, I was I've been right there with you, Nikki. Mm -hmm. um, and and remembering that they're not perfect and that the human is still responsible. They should put a disclaimer on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't get rid of all hallucinations though, because no. it's like you, the whole point of these LLMs and like, we want this to be conversational. We want them to be able mm -hmm. to think and eventually develop like little nuances. And sometimes when you're being creative, you might say something silly. Mm. Yeah. In their case, it's incorrect. It's just I just refer to like, correctly. yeah, I just refer to it like, you know, it's everybody's like favorite sociopath, like your LLM <laughs> is like yes. your favorite little sociopath. So take everything with a grain of salt and fact check. Yeah. And if, <laughs> and if you trained it just on legal cases, it's going to hallucinate less. It's still going to hallucinate. You need it to, More you precisely. Know, it's a good point. But, but you're trying to reduce it. That's all. Mm. And yes, humans should take responsibility at the end of the day for whatever they're using this stuff for. All right, my last prediction regards streaming TV. Uh, I think one of these streaming services, Stars, Max, or Paramount mm. Plus, 
is going to merge into one of these streaming services, either Peacock, Disney Plus, or Amazon by the end of this year. Um, I've been saying for years that as soon as Comcast and Disney figured out the ownership of Hulu and settled that, and as soon as the restrictions on Warner Brothers being able to sell itself ends at the end of April, which was a stipulation of AT&T's divestment uh, and merger to Discovery, uh, we're going to see consolidation theater. And we already had earlier this month yep. the reports that Paramount and Warner were talking to each other about maybe merging. Uh, so I think by the end of this year, one of the smaller streaming services is definitely going to get gobbled up. Uh, one of the smaller studios is going to get gobbled up by a bigger one. And I think it's either Stars Max or Paramount Plus that you will see rolled into Peacock, Disney Plus, or Amazon, just because it's three smaller and three bigger. Well, that was what I was going to ask, because I, I think of Stars Max and Paramount Plus as not being like little players. Yeah, but their studios mm -hmm. are, right? Yeah. Lionsgate is the smallest of these. That's Stars. Max is Warner Brothers Discovery. And as soon as April hits, they're going to be like, who wants to buy us? Uh, and Paramount is is small too. It's, it's Paramount and CBS, but it's way smaller than Disney, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Right. Comcast like those are giants compared to them God I hope you're right I am so tired of all these different streaming platforms <laughs> just one fewer yeah I don't want two well, few well, and that's I, I that's do, an yeah. interesting um take uh Tasia because s some people are like I don't want all you know I don't want it to just be cable again yeah right you know I want to pick and choose my a la carte services and I will pay for the ones that I want accordingly then you get people being like, yeah, but if you do that, you end up paying a lot of money. Exactly. So, And competition is healthy for driving the prices down and increasing kind of like creating more interesting content and pulling people to each platform. Mm -hmm. But yeah, how many platforms are out there right now? Like maybe 10? I think we've got the big ones. too many platforms right now, which is yeah. part, part of, a, of an experimental early market. Yeah. Consolidation is normal. I don't want it to get too consolidated, right? So... Yeah. I'm fine with a little bit of consolidation as long as it doesn't end up with just one or two options. Just one consolidation is what you want. <laughs> just a couple. Yeah, just a little bit. You know, give give me four or five big studios, maybe yeah. maybe maybe up to 10 max, you know, so somewhere in there. That's I mean, a Amazon felt like the real dark horse to me not that long ago. And now it's like they have Thursday night football. Now I American like yes. American football, not everybody's cup of tea, but pretty big deal. Um, the first time, the first time my mom, you know, fired up her Amazon Prime Video uh, Apple TV app, I was like, "What are you watching on Amazon Prime?" She's like, "Football." I was like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, Obviously. of course, of course." Yeah. You know, and and that was only uh, you know a couple months ago um, because you know football season, uh, but uh, that kind of stuff changes things, and I think it I think it will change things uh, pretty dramatically over the next year. I think I think sports rights is oh, a big part of this. That's the biggest issue, Sarah. So like for me, the reason I'm like annoyed with all the different streamers is because we're still the dum dums that have that pay for like direct TV because I need the NHL network. That is how I watch all my hockey games. So it's like, yeah. I need that. So now we have that. Then we've got like, I don't know, four or five different streaming servers. And it's like, what has happened? Like our bill, instead of getting better and being like, we're cutting the cutting the cord. Remember when that was a little quaint sure, little idea yeah. way back mm -hmm. in the day? And it was like, no, we've got the cord and then some. So yeah. if they can figure out the sports thing for me, Game changer. Do you have DirecTV Satellite or DirecTV Now, the streaming Direct version? DirecTV, I don't know. Do you now? have a do you need a satellite dish or you? Just oh, I do have a satellite dish. Yeah, yes, yeah. Because you dish. can get the streaming version, DirecTV Now, which has the NHL Network, because that's how I get it. Um, and the NHL Network is the hard one to find. Yes, um, it really <laughs> is. Saying. In fact, the only reason I have DirecTV Now is I think you can get NHL Network on one other streaming service in the U.S. and you can't get Sportsnet LA, which has the Dodgers. Anywhere that isn't cable except DirecTV now. This is the issue with all the blackouts, which yeah. is the other thing that happens are like rolling blackouts. But And Amazon is talking to Diamond Sports Group, which has the Bally Sports uh, Networks in Ooh. the U.S. Uh, and they're in bankruptcy. So it's going to be a lot to unwind all that. But Amazon might be able to, to help, you know, undo some of those blackouts. We'll see.
Peacock also has a ton of sports stuff. They might yep. they might absorb some of that. I watch some of the international stuff, like the rugby and stuff on there. They always oh have yeah, and soccer and stuff. Yeah. yeah, indeed. All right, so there we go. We have predicted twenty twenty four for you, everybody. Hey, spoiler. <laughs> um, well, we couldn't have done it without you, Dr. Nikki Ackermans, Tasia Custody, and Jen Cutter. Nikki, we'll start with you. Where can folks keep up with your work? If people are interested in finding me, I'm at Nicole Ackermans is my website, dot com. And Ackermans Nicole on Twitter and X and Nicole Ackermans on Blue Sky. I said it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Yeah. Uh, Tasia Custody, thank you so much for joining us. Super fun to have you. Let folks know where they can get with your latest. You can find me at TejaCustody.com. Teja is just Asia with a T, by the way. So if you're worried about spelling, I'm at Teja Custody on literally all of the things. I have a podcast called AI Named This Show with friend of this show, Tristan Jutra. So you can find us at AI Named This Show.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And lastly, head on over to my YouTube channel, which surprise, surprise, is at Teja Custody. <laughs> Yeah. With no shorts. But, but no shorts. <laughs> no shorts. Only, pants only, baby. Only pants. <laughs> uh, Jen Cutter, so nice to have you on our prediction show. Not your first time here. Hopefully not your last. Let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. Well, I am Jen Cutter on every single uh, network that is social. And also YouTube at Jen Cutter, that's all Jen with two N's, where I am launching a series in January talking about the Final Fantasy MMOs and the difference between 11 and 14 over the years. Final Fantasy 11 is 20 years old, so it's been fun to revisit that back when games hated players. <laughs> well, we cannot thank you all enough for being part of our predictions show. Looking forward to next year, right around this time. Let's all come back and see how we did. But just a reminder, patrons, uh, that is it for DTNS in 2023. Thank you all so much for supporting us. We literally could not do this show without you. So holiday break. Hope everybody has a good time. We return to live shows next Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024, with Nika Monfer joining us. You can see the details at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you next year. This week's special episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows included Jen Cutter and Ayaz Akhtar. Our guests this week were Will Smith, Andrea Jones Roy, Tasia Custody, George Sang, Tom D., a.k.a. Captain Jack 913, and Gary Fisher. And thank you, patrons, for making this year of Daily Tech News Show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>